Father, we love you, Lord, and we are just grateful, Lord, just to gather in your name this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord, uh, for a beautiful day. Thank you for another day of life, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for giving us purpose and reason for living, Lord. You provide that to us, the hope that we have in Jesus. We owe it all to you, Lord. I pray whether we're gathered together in, in this place, whether we're outside, whether we're in the foyer, whether we're at home, tuning in online, that we would give you the undivided attention that you alone deserve, Lord. Remove distraction. Help us to focus, Lord, that we can hear from you this morning and truly receive all that you have for us, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Good to see you guys this morning. If you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn back to the book of Acts chapter 2. Book of Acts chapter 2, again, picking it up right where we left off, we will pick up in verse 14, and so if you want to find your place there, Acts chapter 2 verse 14 is where we will begin this morning, Acts 2, 14. Now as you turn there, if you've lived long enough, if you've been around long enough, then you can attest that life is filled with its ups and downs, okay? We've all been there, we've all been through times that we, where we failed and we find ourselves in a valley, almost feeling alone, discouraged, depressed. But there have been other times, again, where, where we found success, where things worked out the way we wished they would, and, and it felt like a mountaintop experience. And so, again, if you've been around long enough, you've been through these things. You recognize the highs and lows. You recognize the ups and downs of life. But one of the interesting things is I look back at my life, and I'm sure you can do the same thing. It's really easy to forget about the highs, to forget about the successes and those mountaintop experiences. It's the failures that we dwell on. Those those lows that we've experienced, again, those discouraging times when all of us, if we're honest, we have all faced. I've had many valley experiences, times where I've blown it and let the Lord down. Again, I, I've been there. I, I know what that's like. And I can tell you that I thank God that we serve a forgiving God. Isn't that right? We can go around the room again if we had the time because we've all been there. We've all let the Lord down. There's none of us are, that are perfect in here. We've all struggled. But I thank God that he is a loving and forgiving God. Jeremiah writes, if you remember, again, Lamentations 3.22, one of those verses you want to have highlighted in your Bible. Jeremiah writes, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God loves, his love never stops. It never stops. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Every morning. Despite what happened yesterday, it doesn't matter because God's love for us never ends. His mercies are new evermore, every morning. Jeremiah says, great is your faithfulness. How beautiful, again, how encouraging that is to us. Because we've all been there. We've all failed. We've all let the Lord down. The good news, because we serve a forgiving and merciful God, is that despite our past That's not the end of our story. God has a future and a hope for us, doesn't he? He has a future and a hope for all of us so that despite what we've done, if we truly have turned from our sin, if we truly have repented and come to the Lord, God has the best in store. He has the best in store for his children. And what's so awesome is that despite our failures, God still wants to use our lives. God saved us for a purpose. He called us for a purpose. And he wants to do something special with our lives. And and we find this this example specifically in the life of Peter. So I love Peter so much. Oh, he put his foot in his mouth several times, right? But God still wanted to use his mouth to do great things. And I love that. Let me remind you very quickly, again, of what we know about Peter. Back in Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus said, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brother. 
Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, Jesus, it's me and you until the wheels fall off, right? I'm always going to be there. What are you talking about? I'm never going to fail you. I'm always going to be by your side. Verse 34, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day, this very day, until you deny me three times that you even know me. Jesus told him, you're going to fail me. You're going to fail me. You're going to deny me. You're going to let me down. And, and guess what happened just a few hours later? Exactly what Jesus said was going to happen, happened. Now, for the sake of time, again, I don't have time to to read and remind you of of his three denials, but remember how it ended. Verse 60, again, Luke 22. Immediately, immediately after Peter had denied the Lord for the third time, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine how Peter felt at that moment? The Lord turned and looked to him. Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, today you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. This was failure. This was disaster. He had truly let the Lord down. But that wasn't the end of Peter's story. God still wanted to use Peter. God was not done with him yet. And that should encourage us this morning. Isn't that right? He wasn't done with him yet. He wasn't done with him yet. This morning, if you remember from last week, it's the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Pente means 50. That means it was 50 days after the Passover when Jesus was crucified, which means it was 50 days after Peter's denial. And in just 50 days, we are going to see an incredible transformation in the life of Peter. If you remember the denial of Peter, one of the people that Peter denied the Lord to was a servant girl. He cowered before a servant girl, afraid to admit that he was with Jesus. And 50 days later, we're going to see such a transformation in his life that he is going to stand bold and strong and courageous, preaching Jesus, identifying himself with Jesus, not to one person, but to what scholars believe had to have been tens of thousands of people. What a difference. What caused this difference? What was the the difference in Peter? And the answer was found in what we covered last week. Last week, we covered the dissension of the Holy Spirit. As God's Spirit was poured out upon the 120 disciples that were meeting together in the upper room, indwelling them and filling them with what we call today Holy Ghost power, right? So that they can do, could do, what they could not do in and of their own strength. That's what happened. He filled them. He empowered them. And it's such a beautiful lesson for us about the difference, the change the Holy Spirit can make in our life. That's what we saw. And that's what we're going to continue to see this morning. This is why, as believers, we need to learn to rely, to humble ourselves, and depend on the Spirit of God. How often? Every single day. He's the one that will give us strength. He's the one that will enable us again to overcome sin and temptation, trial. He's the one. It's so sad, again, as a pastor, I talk to many people struggling in their Christian walk. 90% of the time, They're not in their Bible, and they're not in prayer. Probably the other 10% of the time, they're trying to serve God in their own strength. And they're not humbling themselves and spending time every morning crying out to God and saying, God, fill me with your strength. Help me to be who I'm supposed to be. Help me so I can overcome the the tests and the trials that, that Satan has planned for me that day. It's a difference. And this change, again, is what will enable 
Peter to do what he could not do before. Now, very quickly, again, if you weren't here last week, remember what happened. It began with the coming of the Holy Spirit, right? And when the Holy Spirit came, the disciples were gathered together in the upper room and they heard a sound, what sounded like wind. They didn't feel anything, but they heard a sound. It probably sounded like a hurricane. Then we read verse four, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. That was important. The word tongues is the Greek word glossa. It's where we get the English word glossary. And it refers to other languages and dialects, meaning that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it enabled these uneducated fishermen to speak in other languages, languages they did not know as a sign to them that God was speaking through them. Now, when that happened, remember, this is Pentecost, meaning it's one of the three major feasts All Jews are required to come to the temple and offer a sacrifice every single year. Place had to have been packed. Scholars estimate 2 million people in Jerusalem. Packed. They hear the sound of the Holy Spirit. They come running to see what the sound was. They get there and all of a sudden they hear 120 people praising God in all these different languages. That was important. Why? Because of the requirement of Moses, Jews from all over the Roman Empire had to come to the temple from all these different nations, speaking all these different languages, and they get there and they hear their own language being spoken by a bunch of uneducated fishermen. And they were shocked. They didn't get it. They, they, they could not make, we would say today, heads or tails with what was taking place. And that's what Luke said. Verse 12 and 13, and they were all amazed. You're talking about tens of thousands of people. They're all amazed and they're perplexed. They're puzzled. Saying to one another, notice, what does this mean? What's happening, right? They knew something crazy was happening, right? They knew this had to be a miracle, but they didn't get it. Verse 13, but others, the skeptics, there's always skeptics in the crowd, right? The skeptics in the crowd said, ah, they're just drunk. They're just speaking gibberish, right? That's what happened. They can't explain what's happening. They can't make heads or tails with what is taking place. And so they're asking each other, right? What does this mean? And so to answer their question and to point them to God, Peter preaches to the crowd. Peter steps forth, right? And he preaches what scholars say is the greatest sermon in all the Bible apart from what Jesus taught. We would say it this way. The greatest sermon ever spoken by anyone not named Jesus, okay? That's what it is. We're going to look this morning at Peter's spirit-filled sermon at Pentecost. It's beautiful. And the first thing that we will look at is Peter explaining, keyword explaining, what had happened. You want to take some notes this morning, I, I encourage you to do so. Let's pick it up here, right where we left off, verse 14. But Peter, standing with the 11, with the other 11 apostles, lifted up his voice and addressed them, the crowd. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And give ear to my words. Listen to what I'm about to say. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Now, really interesting. Let me kind of paint a picture for you. I want you to remember different time, different culture. Back then, whenever Jewish rabbis or teachers would preach or teach the word of God, they would always do so sitting down. And it would be the crowd that would stand up. Whenever Jesus taught, whenever you read that, he's sitting down. That's the way they did it back then. And everyone stood up to listen. This is different. Peter is standing up. That's different. No one did that back then, which would have caught their attention. 
He also raises his voice. He's speaking at the top of his lungs for everyone to be able to hear. Now, this is important. Understand that when Peter stepped forward to speak, all of the other disciples would have stopped speaking in tongues. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit would never compete against himself. And so when he stepped forward, very important, we serve a God of order and not confusion. Everyone else would have stopped. And now the Holy Spirit speaks only through Peter. Always order in the church. Peter addresses the skeptic specifically first because they're assuming that they're drunk. And he reminds them, no, that's not what this is. You should know that's not what this is because it's only the third hour. Now, what does that mean? It means the third hour since sunrise. If sunrise is generally at 6 a.m., three hours later is what time? Nine in the morning, okay? He says, no, they're not drunk. It's, it's nine in the morning. Now, some of you might say, I used to drink at nine in the morning, that, that, but it's different, okay? <laughs> different culture, okay? Different culture. Let me explain to you a couple things. Number one, I talked about this last week, Pentecost was on a Sabbath. It was on a Saturday. We know that from the Jewish calendar, which meant it was a holy day or a Jewish holiday, as we would call it. Jews never ate or drank anything until after prayer, specifically on Jewish holidays. Breakfast for the Jews was at 9 a.m. After, I'm sorry, prayer for the Jews was at 9 a.m. And so no one ate until after prayer. No one did. That was the culture back then. The other thing is Jews only drank wine with their meals. They never drank it alone. And so for both of these reason, reasons, Peter makes it clear. No one drank. You know the way it is, right? This is the law of Moses. It didn't happen that way. No one had drank. That's not the explanation. But then he goes on to tell them what really was happening. Verse 16. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. Notice, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. 19, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, and blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord. If you have a pen or highlighter, underline day of the Lord. Very important. The great and magnificent day. To help them understand what was happening, Peter takes them back to the Old Testament. He takes these Jews who knew the Old Testament back to the scriptures for the answer. And what Peter does, if you're taking notes, he quotes from Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32, reminding them of the prophecy the prophet Joel had made. God had spoke through Joel and God declared through Joel that in the last days, God was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. This was a prophecy, okay? This was a promise. Now, why was this significant? Well, if you know your Bible, if you know your Old Testament, you know that in the Old Testament, God would occasionally, if I can even use that word, pour out his spirit upon a single person for a single purpose, and so if you know your Bible, again, God would pour out his spirit upon maybe a prophet for a little while, for a specific time to enable that person or that king to speak for God, to do what God had desired that person to do, right? But it was only temporary. He never remained on them. It was only temporary. And so every Jew from the very beginning desired a day when God's spirit would be poured out upon everyone. 
and he would be with them forever. It's really crazy. Again, as Christians, as we talked about last week, at the moment of salvation, God's spirit comes to dwell within us. And yet we don't understand how big of a deal that is. We take God's spirit for granted. And that's why we grieve the spirit and we quench the spirit by sinning against him, not recognizing what a privilege this is. If we could go back more than 2,000 years and before Pentecost and tell a Jew that we are filled and indwelled with God's spirit and able to receive his power, they would laugh at us. They would say, we wish. I wish that would happen. And so this is what this is about. Joel prophesied a day, a coming time in the last days when God would pour out his spirit and it would be upon everybody. And so Peter says, don't you understand? This prophecy by Joel is coming to pass. It's happened. That's why you have all these people filled with God's spirit, able to do what they could not do in and of themselves. Now, it's interesting, and I want you to notice something. If you look back at the words, the quote from Joel, not only does it talk about God's spirit being poured out, but it also talks about signs and wonders in the heaven and on earth and blood and fire and vapor. We didn't read about any of that happening, right? Well, one of the interesting things, remember, we talked about this a lot when we covered the book of Isaiah, is that oftentimes when God would reveal prophecy it would have what's called near fulfillment and future fulfillment. In other words, remember, I'll give you an example. God told Isaiah that he was going to judge Israel for their sins. That happened through the Assyrians, right? And through the Babylonians during the time of Isaiah. But it also has future fulfillment when they will be judged by the Antichrist. Remember that? In the future, it hasn't happened yet. And so many times throughout prophecy, you have partial fulfillment, like a foretaste, an example that will be fulfilled in greater ways in the end, okay? Partial fulfillment versus ultimate fulfillment. And that's exactly what Joel prophesies. Notice, look back at the verses in verse 20, talks about the blood, the fire, the vapor, the smoke, the sun turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. Now, we've covered this before. What's the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord it does not speak of a 24-hour day. It speaks of a time or a period that begins with the seven-year tribulation, goes through the second coming of Christ, and into the millennial kingdom. Remember, tribulation, well, rapture is going to take place. After that, Antichrist comes, rules for seven years, when God's judgment, the bowls, the scrolls, right, are poured out upon the earth. And when that happens, you might remember, there's going to be blood and smoke and all of these things up until, again, Jesus returns, wipes out the ungodly, battle of Armageddon, and then he establishes his kingdom on earth. And get this. When Jesus comes, right? Remember Matthew 24 separates the sheep from the goats. All the goats are going to be destroyed and all the sheep are going to enter into his kingdom, which means during the millennial reign of Christ, the earth is only going to be filled with believers. You get that? That's the fulfillment when the Holy Spirit will be indwelt among all flesh, everybody. Okay, this is the future fulfillment. It's beautiful when you understand, again, God's plan. Now keep reading, verse 21. And it shall come to pass, this is still a quote from Joel, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now one of the things the Bible teaches is that God in his mercy and his patience, his long suffering, the Bible says, right? Desires all men, all women to be saved. And so all the way up until... The day of the Lord, everyone has an opportunity to be saved, right? Isn't God good? That means if you're backslidden today, you have an opportunity right now because it hasn't happened yet for you to be saved. But in order for you to be saved, what do you have to do? You have to call on the name of the Lord. Is that important? Here's the million dollar question. Who's the Lord? Now we know that, right? But did the Jews know that? 
They just put him on a cross. They didn't believe he was Lord. And so what happens next? As we move on, Peter now desiring his fellow countrymen to be saved. Peter explains to them who the Lord is. This message is about Jesus. So you move on. Jesus procla- um, Peter proclaims that Jesus is Messiah and Lord. Verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him, notice, in your midst. For three years, Jesus was in and out all over through Israel, right? Doing miracles. They seen it. Notice, as you yourselves know. To help them understand that Jesus is Lord, he takes them back. Talks about Jesus' life and ministry. Everything Jesus did, right? They were there. They seen it. He was one of them. Everything he did, the miracles, right? Casting out demons, healing the sick, walking on water. Think about everything he did. All of it was evidence, was proof that he truly was the Messiah. And it's obvious, right? It's so obvious. I love Peter's words. He says, as you yourselves know, I like that. I truly believe in my heart that down deep inside, everyone knows who Jesus is. I believe it. You can try to call yourself an atheist or an agnostic. You can try to, again, reject the Lord all you want. Down deep inside, you know one day you're going to stand before him in judgment. We all know. That's what Peter said. He said, you guys know. You guys knew this. You guys knew this. And you know what the truth was? They did know it. Let me remind you again, three years earlier, when Jesus just began his ministry, in John 3, verse 2, the apostle John tells a story of a Pharisee who came to Jesus by night in secret. Verse 2, this man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know, get it? We know. This is the Pharisees. We know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. They knew it. The evidence was there, okay? They simply refused to believe it. They simply rejected him as their Messiah. And so number one, again, Peter explains that through the life and ministry, Jesus proved that he was the Messiah, But there was so much more. Keep reading verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you, underline the you, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter says that the life and ministry proves that he is Lord, but then he goes on to say the crucifixion and death also proves that Jesus was the Messiah. He says, you know Jesus, right? The one you crucified? Talk about stepping on toes, right? This is the same guy that was afraid to admit to a servant girl that he was identified with Jesus, now calls out tens of thousands of people as you guilty, dirty, rotten murderers. Does that take some boldness? This took courage, but he did it. He stepped on toes again. He called them out. Now, this is beautiful. Why? Because sadly, we live in a day and age where most preachers are afraid to offend anybody. Isn't that right? And they water down their messages and they put sugar on on their messages because they're so afraid that people are going to get offended and not come back to their church. And that's what we see. That's the majority now, guys. That's the majority. And it's sad. Not Peter. Uh Uh-uh. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he steps on toes, doesn't he? He calls them out on their sin. He's not into preaching a happy, inspirational message. He calls them out. This is what they needed. It's very, very important. We understand that this is what they needed. They were guilty, and they needed to know that they were guilty. It was important that they understand that they were sinners before God. The interesting thing, and I want to draw your attention to this, notice back in verse 23, 
that although they were guilty and responsible, Peter said that Jesus' death was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. That was the plan of God. Yeah, they were guilty. He's not excusing. They were guilty. They did it. But God knew it was going to happen. God planned for it to happen. Why did God plan for it to happen? Because he was the Messiah. That's why. That's why. His death and crucifixion proves again who he is. Keep reading. Verse 25, or verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter goes from reminding them of the life and ministry that he had that proved he was the Messiah to the crucifixion and death that proved he was the Messiah, now to the resurrection that proves he is the Messiah. Death couldn't hold them. Death can't hold God, right? That's what he says. Death couldn't hold them. Might be able to hold us prior to Jesus, but death cannot hold God down, he says. He's raised. You know why he was raised? Because death could not hold him. You know why death couldn't hold him? This is what Peter's saying. Because he's the Messiah. All of it, again, proves who he is. Verse 25. For David says concerning Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand that I might, may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope for you will not abandon my soul to Hades. Hades is the grave, the place of the dead, or let your holy one see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will make me full of gladness. Notice with your presence. What Peter does now, it's beautiful, is he wants to prove from Scripture that Jesus is the Messiah. Takes him back to Scripture. Again, every good sermon is filled with Scripture, amen? That's what he's doing. He takes him back to Scripture. This time, first he quoted Joel, now he quotes Psalms. He quotes Psalm 16, 8 through 11. This was a psalm written by King David. And in this psalm, David spoke about his body being resurrected and not left in the grave to rot. That's kind of interesting. Why? A couple things. Number one, David lived a thousand years before Jesus. No one had been resurrected back then. And yet he spoke about being resurrected, right? Being taken into God's presence so that his body would not remain in the grave, in the place of the dead, and see corruption and rot in the grave. Now that's interesting. David's writing about something that the Jews couldn't explain. For thousands of years they couldn't explain All they knew is that David wrote it, but they didn't understand really what it meant. And so Peter, under the inspiration of the Spirit, explains what it meant. That when David wrote this down, he was speaking as a prophet of God. It was God speaking through him, and that what he described, what he wrote, would not apply to him, but to a descendant that would come through him. It would come through the Messiah. It would be fulfilled in the Messiah. That's what Peter explains. Verse 29, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now, let me explain what he's saying. One of the, when you go to Israel, and I hope we, You have all can go one day if you've never been. Lord willing, help me pray next February. I want to go back to Israel. Okay, I'm hoping it's open by next February. One of the most interesting places that you go, if you choose to, is to go see the tomb of David. It's interesting. I'm going to tell you why. 
The tomb of David has been there. He is encased in a fancy big old casket. And it's been there for thousands of years. And when you go there, it's really kind of, kind of freaky, if I can use that word. It's kind of weird. But when you go there, it is surrounded by Jewish men that surround the tomb. And they pray and they sing and they sing, read psalms. It's kind of, kind of weird. I don't know. I get weirder stuff like funerals are kind of weird, right? That still goes on to this day. As I've stood with it, I got pictures of it. It's just kind of weird. And they're loud and they're praising and they're worshiping again and they're loud, but it's just kind of weird. They're around a casket. Now that's always been there. And that's what Peter says. Peter goes, wait a minute. Don't you understand that what King David wrote did not apply to him? David's right here in the tomb. He's right here in the casket. He died. He was buried. His body has rotted. He's probably dust by now. That's what Peter's saying. David was never resurrected. This did not apply to him. But let me explain what David meant. Verse 30. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne. We call it a son of David. David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, to the place of the dead, nor did his flesh see corruption. Peter breaks it down. This is what happened. This psalm pertained to the coming Messiah who would be a descendant of David. God promised David that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, Psalm 132. And so David writes about his son, his descendant, that would be resurrected from the dead, he would be the Messiah, and his body would not rot in the grave. And then Peter says, verse 32, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Did the disciples see the risen Savior? Yes, they did. And they're saying, don't you understand? He's Jesus. He's the one that fulfilled this. He's the the Messiah, right? He's the Messiah. We've seen it. We all see. We've seen it with our own eyes. He fulfilled this. Again, the scriptures prove he is the Messiah. Verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he was poured out. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Now, one of the things I want to remind you is that prior to Jesus ascending back up to heaven, he gave the promise of the Holy Spirit, right? He says, it's better if I go, because if I don't go, I won't send the Spirit. But if I go, I promise to send the Spirit to you. Peter explains what's happening here What happened today on Pentecost is proof, not only that Jesus is the Messiah, not only that he was resurrected, not only that we've seen him ascend back up to heaven, but he is now at the right hand of God and has now sent the spirit whom he promised. And the fact that you see these things taking place today is proof that he's in heaven, he's in God's presence, he's at the right hand of the Father, sitting on the throne and has sent the Holy Spirit. He wraps it up. He makes it so simple again, explaining what took place. But Peter's not done. Verse 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but David himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, I love this. Again, I love what Peter's doing, right? Peter's a preacher. And he's backing up. He's laying more scripture on them to further his point, to prove it beyond, we would say, a shadow of a doubt. He says, let me give you another scripture. Let me quote another psalm to you to show you that what David wrote down was not for him. He was speaking about the Messiah. What he does again in verses 34 and 35 is he quotes from Psalm 110, verse 1. 
It's another psalm if you're taking notes. And this is very interesting. Why? Well, take a look at this. David said, the Lord said to my Lord. Now that's kind of interesting. Here is the king, King David, and yet he describes a conversation taking place between the Lord and his Lord. The first Lord is the word Yahweh. It refers to God the Father. The second Lord refers to David's Lord. Speaking of the Son of God. And it's a conversation that the Father has to the Son, whom David calls his Lord, his Messiah. The Father tells the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now remember what happened. Jesus resurrected. Forty days later, he ascends to heaven, and he, having finished his work, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't that right? The right hand of the Father is in the Father's presence. Let me ask you this question. How long will Jesus remain there? Until what? Until he comes back in the second coming, right? When he comes back in the second coming, I've already shared with you, he's going to wipe out the ungodly, battle of Armageddon, and he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. And so the father tells him, sit at my right hand, sit on the right hand, right side of the throne. He's also God. He also sits on the throne. He's on the right side until I wipe out your enemies and you're able to establish your kingdom on earth. That's the prophecy made a thousand years before Jesus. And so Peter's point is, that's where Jesus is. We know he's there. He sent the spirit. That's why this has happened. He's seated until he is going to return to establish his kingdom on earth. He's the Lord. That's who he is. And he wants his countrymen to understand he's the Lord. Now remember, this is the same thing the Apostle Paul taught. Let me remind you, Philippians 2, 9 and 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess. Confess what? That Jesus is who? That he's Lord. Same word, okay? To the glory of God the Father. He's the Lord. He's the only one. He's the one you must confess in order to be saved, right? Look at verse 36. Peter summarizes. He wraps up his sermon, right? Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain, for sure, that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, the Messiah. And then notice this, that Jesus, whom you crucified, he steps on their toes again, right? That's what he does. That's who he is. He's the one. He's the only one that can save you. You know the one that you crucified? He's the one. And again, he wants them to know it. He wanted them to understand 100%. He's the one. They killed him. The one who came to save them. They killed him. They were guilty. But he was their only hope. He is their only hope. How many of you know that, again, we're talking about this great sermon. In every great sermon, you should find three things. In case you're wondering, in case you ever aspire to be a preacher, right? Number one, you explain what happened. You explain the text. Agree? Number two, every sermon should be about Jesus. We proclaim Jesus. And number three, we exhort the crowd to repent. Every great sermon, is spo- that's, what's spo- that's the pattern. That, that's, a way, that's, that's what we're supposed to follow. If a sermon doesn't have those things... Something's wrong. Something's missing. Okay? That's the problem with these sermons today that are just inspiring and happy and all that kind of stuff. They're missing the essential ingredients. And so, as we look at this last thing, Peter exhorts the crowd to repent. Look at verse 37. Now when they, the crowd, heard this, they were cut to the heart. The word cut to the heart literally means pierced with a sword. 
Isn't the word of God sharper than a double-edged sword? They were pierced to the heart. We would say it this way. They were convicted. And said to Peter, notice, and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what do we do now? That's what they say, right? How many of you believe they had desperation in their voice? I believe that. Now, this is important. Why? Because remember, Jesus said this was going to happen when the Holy Spirit came. Let me show you. Back, remember, last supper, Jesus says, John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you, verse 8, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin. That's his job. Yes, I know no one likes to feel conviction, right? But we need it. And when we feel conviction, as much as we might not like it, right? As much as we might be squirming in our seat or perspiring on our forehead, right? That means God's at work. It's a good thing, okay? I would rather be convicted hearing from God than not hear him at all. And that's what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. He comes to convict the world concerning sin, number one, and righteousness, in other words, calling us to right living, revealing to us if we're not living right, we're in sin. And if we don't repent, judgment's coming. That's why he came. That's his job. It's a good thing. This needed to happen. This was supposed to happen. They had crucified their Lord. They had murdered again their Messiah. And the Holy Spirit came again to help them understand that. So that they would feel guilty. So that they would understand if they did not do something, they were going to face God's judgment. Which is why in their desperation, they say what? What do we do now? Tell us. I I love the fact that they look to the disciples, right? They were guilty in their sin, and so they looked to the men of God to tell them what they needed to do. Now, what's so beautiful about this, and, and I hope you would really take note of this, is this is what true conviction looks like. It's important. This is what true conviction looks like. When you are really sorry for your sin, you won't just say you're sorry. You won't just feel sorry. When you truly feel the conviction of God and you sense the fear of God that you need to get right with God, then you come clean before God. Every time I talk to someone and I start hearing people make excuses for their sin, why they did that, well, you don't know what I was going through, that ain't conviction. When you're truly convicted before God, you just shut your mouth. You just come to God and say, God, just tell me what to do, okay? No excuses. You accept your responsibility. You sin before God. You're going to burn in hell if you don't repent. And you just say, God, what do I do? Tell me. That's what's supposed to happen. That is a sign of true conviction. And so hearing that, verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. Underline that word, such an important word, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The crowd asked The most important question that we all need to ask, right? What do I need to do to be saved? Saved from sin, saved from hell, saved from God's judgment. What do I need to do? That's the million dollar question. And Peter tells them, let me lead you in the sinner's prayer. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. What did he say? Repent. You see, too many people want to go to heaven, but they don't want to repent. They don't want to repent. They want to still be able to live like they want to live. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
The word repent, write this down if you don't know, the word repent refers to a change of mind that results in someone turning from their sin and turning to God. That's what it means. You have a change of mind. You recognize the way you were living. The way you were thinking was wrong. It was leading you down the wrong road, the road that leads to destruction. And so you understand you need to change. And so you turn from sin. You make a U-turn. You reverse your direction and you turn to God. That's what repentance is. How do you want to know if someone repented? They don't live like they lived anymore. I've seen too many people, I've talked to too many people over my 30 years serving Jesus that said, oh, I said a, I'm a Christian because I said a prayer 20 years ago at the Harvest Crusade. What does that mean? What are you doing right now? Are you serving Jesus right now? Are you living for God right now? That's what matters. That's the proof. That's the proof. Repentance. That's it. Repentance. We need to turn. If you haven't turned, you're not saved. You're not saved. Period. If you're still living in your same old sin that you used to, you're not saved because you haven't repented. It's that simple. But we want to make excuses and we want to water it down. We want to say, oh, God loves me the way I am and he understands. He understands you're going to burn in hell if you don't repent. That's what's important. That's what he said. It's heavy. I know I'm stepping on toes, but I'm sorry, right? Inspired by God's spirit. This is what needs to come out, okay? This is what needs to come out. And so, this is what he said. He tells the Jews, you need to repent. You have rejected Jesus up to the point where you crucified him. You need to repent. You need to change. Change your thinking. You didn't think he was the Messiah. Now you need to believe he is. That's repentance. You need to change. Turn from your religion and turn to a relationship with your Messiah. And this is why he told them, and be baptized every one of you. Now, some have misinterpreted this verse to think it says that in order to be saved, you have to repent and be baptized. That's not what, it's, that's not what it says. Does baptism save us? No. Was the thief on the cross baptized? No. It doesn't save us. What is baptism? Baptism is an outward sign of something you do publicly as a demonstration of what you've done on the inside. It's an outward expression of an inward reality. That's what baptism is. If you repented that day, I, can't, I wouldn't know it or not. But if you were baptized, you would show something, right? That's what this is. You see, Peter tells them, you want to prove that you want to be a follower of Jesus? You want to prove that you have, you're truly convicted and you've turned to God in repentance? Then do something to show it. And he called upon them to be baptized. Now, this is interesting. Why? Why? Well, how many of you have ever been to a church where the preacher up there at the end of the message said this? Okay, I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Have we ever seen that before or heard that? Why does the preacher do that? The preacher does that because he wants to make it as easy as possible, right? For someone to come to Jesus. We want, no one has to look. No one has to see what you're doing. That's not biblical. Peter does the opposite. Peter goes, you want to prove you, you're going to repent? then you're going to take your clothes off, your robe, and you're going to get dunked in water in front of all these tens of thousands of people. You willing to do that? That's what this is. Unashamed. Willing to turn from our sin. Willing to sacrifice publicly in front of everybody. That's why Peter told them to prove it. Verse 40. And with many other words, Jesus, or I'm sorry, Peter bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. God moved. Spirit convicted. The people responded. 
Now, interesting, and I'll close with this. 3,000 people got saved that day, right? We're dunked in water that day. Praise the Lord. But scholars estimate that there was probably 100,000 people there. It's 3%. It's great. It sounds great. Like, yeah, right, 3,000. But the reality was only a few. Right? It was only a few. But isn't that the way it is? Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to everlasting, and few find it. The good news is God's not into numbers. God is into souls that are serious about serving him and who are willing again to do whatever is necessary to show the Lord they mean business. Amen. That's what happened. Let's pray. Again, Father, we thank you this morning, Lord God, for your love and your goodness, Lord. We thank you for your word. Help us, Lord God. Let your spirit even right now, Lord, have its way. Speak to us, challenge us, draw us to you, remind us there's nothing in this world going to hell for, nothing worth it. And so I pray, Lord, you be glorified, you speak, draw back the backslider, draw believers closer to you, Lord, you do what you know we need personally. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, guys.